Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to have everybody in again this afternoon, and uh, we've even got a couple traveling through from Indiana. We're always glad to have out-of-state folk come in and enjoy the afternoon with us. And for those of you joining us on television, I think most of you know that we're just an informal Bible study, but on the other hand, every day we get mail of people who have just found the program for the first time. Seems unbelievable, doesn't it? But uh, for those of you who have just tuned in and have just caught us, why uh, we're not associated with any particular group. We're not underwritten. We are just totally independent. And as I tell people, I've got the greatest fundraiser in the universe, and it's the Lord Himself. And that's all we depend on, that as the Lord makes the funds available, we have been able to reach out to more and more people. So again, we just thank the folks here in Tulsa that have come in to make a part of our class here in the studio. And uh, we're just going to get right into what this program is all about, and that's studying the Word. So here in the studio, you've already turned to Hebrews chapter 6. And for those of you joining us on television, uh, we trust that you too will just take up your Bible and uh, search the Scriptures with us. All right, in Hebrews chapter 6 now then, we are faced with that word Paul uses over and over. And what is it? Therefore. And you know, I can almost always stop 30 minutes on just the word therefore. <laughs> because you see, he's reminding us of what he had just covered in those previous verses in the last part of chapter 5. And you remember in our last program, we were talking about Paul lamenting the fact that these people were not skilled in the Word of God. They were not able to go out and teach others, but they were like babes on a milk bottle. They still had to be fed. What a dilemma. And yet, you know, that's the average believer. <coughs> the average believer has not made enough effort to search the Scriptures, to get skilled with them, to be comfortable in sharing it with someone else. Now, we hope that this is what we're accomplishing in our kind of teaching, that we are getting people to have enough understanding of the Scripture to be able to sit down with someone who is totally ignorant and just show them. And I think I shared in our last taping that I had just had a couple phone calls from men who worked in corporate situations. And someone came in and asked the appropriate question. And both of them, both of them said that they just got out a sheet of paper and drew the timeline. And uh, what a glorious way to share the scriptures, see? And so this is what Paul was lamenting in those previous verses that You've got to get off the milk bottle. You've got to get into the strong meat and be able to teach others also. Therefore, <laughs> therefore, since that's what he has covered, look what the verse says. Leaving the principles of the doctrines or the teachings of Christ and let us go on unto perfection. Now I'm going to stop right there. And I'm thinking I'll cover the whole next 30 minutes on just these few words, maybe the next 60 minutes, I don't know. But there is so much right there that the casual reader just reads over it. You know, that's the other response we're getting in so many of our letters. You've taught me how to read. Well, not that they couldn't read as reading goes, but people don't stop to analyze what it really says. See, And this is what we have to do. So therefore, since we have to come away from that milk bottle environment and get into the deep things that we can share with other people, we have to start someplace. And what's the next word? Leaving. Now what do you suppose leaving means? Well, it means what it says. Now let me take you back because the only way to teach Scripture is to compare it with Scripture. Come back with me to Ephesians. Chapter 5, and here we have the uh, whole marriage situation for us in this age of grace, the husband and wife relationship. So I want you to drop in at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. I didn't even remember which verse it was, but it's verse 31. And all I'm doing this for is so that you get the meaning of the word leaving. Ephesians 5, 
verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and then the two are to be one flesh. Now, look at that a little more than just seeing a beautiful wedding ceremony. What really happens when a young couple gets married and sets up their own home? What happens between them and their parents? Well, they don't forsake them. They don't say, bye, Dad, I'll see you in glory. That isn't what marriage does. Marriage is still connected with both generations. But what does that young couple suddenly realize? The rent is due. <laughs> the car payments have to be made. Groceries have to be bought. The electric bill is staring them in the face. The phone bill. Hey, they've never had this before, for the most part. And so what is it? It's a whole progressive step from living in the home nest to all of a sudden establishing a home of their own. But they don't forsake that which has gone before they merely move on away from it and still keeping the ties to the home folks. Now, is that understandable? Now, that's exactly, well, of course, it started back in Genesis. You had the same word. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife. And so that's the whole concept. But it's not a matter of the point I'm trying to make. It's not a, man, a matter of totally forsaking the parents. It's simply moving on. In fact, the more I study Hebrews, getting ready for these programs, the more I've come to the conclusion, under the heading of the letter to the Hebrews, they could have added a letter promoting progression. Because that's what Hebrews is all about, to keep moving and moving and moving. And as I was studying a little bit again last night, I couldn't help but think that in the world around us, isn't that exactly true? There is no status quo, at least not until you retire. And Iris and I were talking on the way up. I wonder what it would be like to be retired. <laughs> we have no idea. But for the average person going through life, there is no status quo if you're going to succeed in life. What am I saying? Whether it's a sports team, whether it's a pro football team, whether it's a college program, whether it's a business, whether it's a marriage, whether it's an education, you have to either keep moving forward, be it ever infinitesimal, you've got to keep moving forward or else what? Back you go. You know, I'm always using the analogy of paddling a canoe upstream. Oh, you may not be making much headway, but I'll tell you what, the, mit, the minute you pull that paddle out of the water, you're going to make some movement, but it's going to be back down. All right, now that's exactly the way we have to look at Scripture. There is no such thing in this progressive unfolding of the Word of God of a status quo. We have to either keep moving on and learning and getting deeper into the Word, or we're going to get careless. We're going to lose interest. And so it always holds that we have to leave that which has gone before for the purpose of moving on. And that's exactly what he's talking about. Now, let's look at the verse again. Therefore, leaving, in other words, don't forsake it. You don't turn your back on and say, I don't want any more to do with that. But you move from that one place into a progressive unfolding of that which lies ahead. But what is the apostle admonishing these people to leave? The teachings or the doctrine of the principles or all the Greek that I can find and the various dictionaries and the various commentators, they all use the same thing. And if you have a good marginal help in your Bible, it'll be in your margin. This word principles is better translated the words of the beginning of Christ. Now think about that for a minute. I'm taking this slow. I just reminded myself all night long last night. Now, Les, don't get in a hurry. Take this chapter slow. I don't care if we have to put two, three books on chapter six. We're going to take it slow. 
because this is so important that people understand that here we have to see these Hebrews, to whom, of course, the letter is primarily written. These Hebrews have to understand now that they cannot rest on the status quo. They certainly don't want to be left slipping back, but they got to move on ahead in their experience and their knowledge of the Word of God. And the only way they could do that would be to leave the words of the beginning of Christ. Now that just flies in the face of most of Christendom, doesn't it? All right, what were the words of the beginning of Christ? What are the principles of Christ? The four Gospels, His earthly ministry, see? All right, now let's look what Paul says concerning that in Romans chapter 15. And dropping down, I think it is, to verse 8. Romans 15, verse 8. And again, I imagine the vast majority of people who read their Bibles skim over this verse and never really understand what it said. But oh, it's loaded. It says it all of what we're looking at now today, that we're going to have to move away from the first words of Christ, His earthly ministry, because here's the purpose. Verse 8, Romans 15, where Paul says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was, past tense, a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made to the fathers. Now look at that. Just look at that. You know, I read the Jerusalem Post from cover to cover, and quite often there's an article in there with regard to these young Jewish men who are in yeshivas. And of course, that's part and part of Israel's history. Now, what do these young Jewish men do in a yeshiva? Well, they'll sit there day in and day out and contemplate maybe one verse of the Torah. And they've been doing that for centuries. And what do they still hope to do? Pull something out of there that some previous rabbi had never seen. And that's what they do day after day. All right, now I don't expect anybody to do that. We're not in yeshivas, but goodness sakes, let's take a verse like this now again and pick it apart. What does it really say? Well, it says that Jesus Christ was the minister of the circumcision. Who's the circumcision? Israel. Israel. So Paul is reminding us, that great apostle of the Gentiles, that Jesus Christ, in the beginning of His words here on earth, was to what people? Israel. You know, I'm always stressing every word that Jesus said in His earthly ministry, with two exceptions, was always to the Jew under the law. Oh, goodness, that rankles people. You know, I, I get a kick out of how it does, because it, it does. It just sort of, it sort of makes me smile that people can get so shook up with truth. You know, that reminds me on our last cruise. We uh, had a couple from out east someplace. I'm not going to identify them. But anyway, uh, one of the clergy of their particular denomination or whatever was on the ship with us, and they had gotten acquainted with him, and they had gotten him to come to one of our Bible studies. Well, it didn't take me two minutes to see that the guy was just enraptured with what he was seeing. Oh, he was just eating it up for the whole two, three hours that we were together that evening. So this couple said, well, we're going to make sure that he's back tomorrow night. But tomorrow night came and he wasn't there. And I said, well, goodness sakes, what happened? Ah, uh, she says, he didn't want to be confused with the truth. And isn't that exactly right? See, people say, don't bother me with facts. I'm satisfied with whatever flies. But listen, we're going to look at this in truth. What does the Word say? Not what Les Feldick says. What does the book say? 
Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. And then what's the next statement? For the truth of God. How does that do? Hey, that just nails it down. This wasn't something that flippantly came off the lips of the Apostle Paul. This was in accord with the whole sovereign working of the Creator God, that Christ should come to the nation of Israel. And then what does the rest of us say? To confirm the promises made to whom? The fathers. Well, who were the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the rest of the Old Testament patriarchs. David, see? Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, you name them. They were all talking about the coming of this Messiah King. And that's what Jesus came to proclaim, that he was the fulfillment of those promises made to the fathers of Israel. See? And that's so hard for people to comprehend. They think that Jesus came like I had one guy explode in one of our classes in Israel. I've shared it with some of you at least. My, he said, what do you do with John 3.16? Throw it away? No. No. John 3.16 was the fulfillment of Christ's coming to his earthly people. And then when he was rejected, yes, then he went to the whole world. But for three years, he was the minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the Father. Now see, when you pick it apart and take it slow, doesn't it make sense? Sure it does. Just as sensible as it can be that he came to fulfill those Old Testament promises. He never once told those 12 disciples, I'm going to be going to the cross and be crucified and raise up another apostle and send him to the Gentiles. Not in a way that they could understand it. No. All right, now then, let's go back and, and see some of those words of the beginning of Christ. And let's just jump all the way back to Matthew. I'm going to jump in first at Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. <clears throat> Matthew 5, verse 17. And this, of course, is the beginning of his earthly ministry. All there? Matthew 5, verse 17. And Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophets, I'm not come to destroy, but what? Fulfill. Well, isn't that exactly what Paul just said in Romans? Why did he come? To fulfill the promises made to the fathers. Now, I'm not going to go back and chase up all the references because that would take too long, but I'll just rehearse a few of them. Way back in Exodus already, what did God promise that the Jewish people could be individually? Priests of God. Every Jew was to become a go-between. Well, between God and who? The Gentiles. Those pagans out there around them. Now, it wasn't going to be tomorrow. It wasn't going to be next month. But some way after the hundreds of years, Israel was going to have that opportunity and responsibility to announce their Messiah and King, as also the Redeemer of the Gentile world. All right, then you come all the way up, based, of course, on that Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12. Isaiah writes so plainly that the nation of Israel is to be a light to the Gentiles. And then Daniel introduces us to the whole concept of an earthly kingdom over which the stone cut out without hands, which of course is always a reference to Christ, would take over and rule the whole planet. Zechariah tells us as plain as day that when he would return and stand on the Mount of Olives, he would set up a kingdom. He would rule from Jerusalem and he would be king over all the earth. Well, see, those were all promises that the the spiritual Jew at least, probably not all of them, but the spiritual part of Israel understood 
that this is what was in their future, that God himself in the person of the Messiah, the Son of God, would be coming and establishing an earthly kingdom with his capital in Jerusalem, and Israel would enjoy all those promises of Deuteronomy 27 and 28. And what are those promises? Oh, you'll not be the tail, you'll be the head. You'll be blessed when you go out, you'll be blessed when you come in. Those were the promises that Israel was longing for. And oh, they're looking for them even today. Maybe not in the right quarters, but in their heart. Now, those of you who read anything at all of the Jewish people, in the heart of every Jew for centuries has been that longing statement, next year what? Yeah, you got it. Next year, Jerusalem. Sounds like farmers. You know, farmers are always waiting for next year. But that was the heart of the Jew. Next year, Jerusalem. Next year, peace. Jerusalem, the Prince of Peace ruling and reigning. All right, those were the promises that Christ came to the nation of Israel to fulfill. And that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about the cross here. He's talking about fulfilling those Old Testament promises. And he wasn't coming to destroy the law. He wasn't coming to destroy the prophets. He came to fulfill everything that they've been writing about, see? To confirm the promises. All right, now, time's running fast. Turn with me ahead a couple pages to uh, chapter 9. Chapter 9, and just drop in at verse 35. Now, don't lose sight of what I'm trying to show here. We're looking at the words of the beginning of Christ, His earthly ministry. What was He telling these Jewish people and that these people that Paul is addressing now in the book of Hebrews had evidently embraced, they had become followers and believers of Jesus now. Now don't forget your time setting. The book of Hebrews is being written at a time when most of these people to whom Paul is writing were certainly adults during Christ's earthly ministry, even as Paul himself was. So he's talking about people who had probably become believers during Christ's earthly ministry. And now the whole idea of the book of Hebrews is, move on. You know, when I first started the book way back in chapter 1, you remember I reminded you that throughout the book of Hebrews it says, that was good, but this is better? Sure. And what is that? That's a progressive. Moving out of that which was good, and going to something that's better. All right, but now we're still back here at the beginnings of the words of Christ. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching. Now watch this. If you haven't underlined it before, underline it today. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, what does that word gospel always mean? Good news. He was announcing the good news of the kingdom. What does that mean? Hey, he's the king. He's here on the earth, ready to fulfill the promises. So he's preaching the good news of the kingdom of heaven. Now, along with that gospel of the kingdom, of course, we have, read on, he healed every sickness among the people and every disease, none accepted. That's the difference. When Jesus healed the multitudes, he healed them all. But they weren't all believers. Don't ever get that idea. The press, as we sometimes refer to it, those multitudes in upon him, Hey, they weren't following him because of his spiritual offers. They were following him for what I've said before, the free lunch. Nothing they liked better is when he came out with that loaves and fishes. And I'm going to be making reference to it sometime as I go into the book of Hebrews. But uh, you remember back in John's Gospel when the disciples had been fishing all night and had caught nothing? And they came to shore and there the Lord was. 
And he asked him, you remember, have you any food? Have you meat? Nah, they hadn't caught a thing all night. But in the next verse, it tells us that while he was standing on shore, what was also beside him on the shore? Bread and fish on the fire. And you know when I rehearsed that again the other night, you know what a thought struck me never has before? Since he's the creator, he's the perfect operator of anything. You ever stop thinking he must be the best chef the world has ever seen? I'll bet that was the best taste in fish and bread that those disciples had ever tasted. And that gave rise then to the Lord's question. Peter, do you love me more than those? And I'll bet it was kind of tough to say, well, yes, Lord, because that must have been mighty good taste in food. Well, that's beside the point. But he came to fulfill all these promises given to the nation of Israel. And when he did, he healed every sickness, every disease, see? Because after all, what was he proving? That he was the Christ. That's what these words of the beginning of Christ were to do, was to prove to Israel who he was. Now, you've heard me say that a hundred times, haven't you? All right, now then, let's skip over into chapter 10. And you have no idea how mad people can get when you show them these verses. Now, you wouldn't think people would get angry at the Word of God, would you? Oh, but they do. They do. If it flies in the face of what they've always thought and known, oh, they can get angry. I got heads nodding all over the place. Sunday school teachers, you know what it's like. Oh, they can get angry. But look what it says. I probably haven't got time to do it justice. I don't think I do. But anyway, chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and disease. See that? He's imparting to them the same powers that he was exercising. And now the names of the twelve are these. And we're not going to go through and, and rehearse them because you all certainly know who the twelve disciples were. But all right. We'll come all the way down to verse 5, and uh, before I go into the verse, I'm going to wind this half hour up because I want to be able to continue on with verse 5 and 6, and that is that Jesus has just now chosen the twelve. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.